So tell the story of North Korea Freedom Week and what happened in Washington as you worked with some defectors and tried to get them to speak to some in the administration. The first thing we do, North Korea Freedom Week, we all go to church together and then that afternoon these North Koreans who were raised to hate us, to believe that we were the enemy, go to the Korean War Memorial and they lay a wreath at the Korean War Memorial to honor the Americans who died making South Korea free and pledged their lives to do what they did and honor them by making North Korea free. It's a very emotional ceremony. We uh, have, uh, usually have Korean War veterans there, uh, but it's, it's very powerful because these are people that were, were brainwashed to hate us and now they know we were, the, we were the good guys, so to speak. That's how we start North Korea Freedom Week. But in this particular year, we tried so hard these defectors were so anxious to talk to Donald Trump or even Mike Pence because they believe that he's a strong leader who understands evil and understands uh, what is necessary uh, regarding North Korea. They were so anxious to talk to him, but we were uh, unsuccessful in trying to meet with people that were rep representing Donald Trump. That was a huge disappointment because our belief was if Donald Trump had met with these people, it would have sent a powerful signal to people in the regime that Donald Trump cared about the North Korean people. Because, and, and it would have been a powerful signal because these are defectors that are known back in North Korea. And it would have shown his commitment to the freedom of, uh, and human rights for the people of North Korea. A critical time when there's such an escalation of focus on the nuclear issue. And, the, and in fact, the focus on the nuclear issue benefits Kim Jong-un because it proves his lie. And the lie that he tells his people is, we have to have nuclear weapons because the Americans want to destroy our, our prosperous, wonderful nation. That's a lie. But when we don't focus on human rights, when we don't talk to the people of North Korea, we feed into Kim Jong-un's lie. A tweet would have, would have sent a nail into the heart of Kim Jong-un acknowledging North Korea Freedom Week, acknowledging the work of these people that are trying to uh, free their homeland from tyranny. But I wanted to tell you something amazing that happened during North Korea Freedom Week. We had done a program where we reached out to members of Congress and we said, if you had a chance to say something to the, uh, the people of North Korea, what would you say to them? And we did this for the new year and we did it for August 15th, which is their Liberation Day, which both North and South Korea celebrate. So we went to these members of Congress, Democrats and Republicans, and said, just send us a message of what you would say to the people of North Korea. And of course, we got these powerful messages about freedom and opportunity and hope and how much the Americans care about the people of North Korea. So we started broadcasting these over the last several years um, into North Korea on Free North Korea Radio. And what happened during North Korea Freedom Week is the defector delegation showed up with three hand-woven silk portraits it's the most beautiful work I've ever seen. It, it, it looks like a photograph. They shimmer because they're made out of silk. And these portraits were made of Senator Ted Cruz, Congressman Ed Royce, and Congressman Chris Smith, who had been participating in this program. And they came out with a message from two brothers in Pyongyang, Pyongyang, the capital of North Korea, the center of the, that dictatorship. Two brothers in Pyongyang said, we spent three months making these portraits for the Americans, politicians who sent their messages. Please tell them there's some people in a dark place who still have hope. Now understand, three months it took them to make that. If they had been caught, they were most certainly have been executed. But they were so moved by the messages from American politicians that they took the time to make these beautiful portraits. And that was one of the highlights of North Korea Freedom Week, delivering those to the members of Congress that participate in the program. Explain the possible policy reasons or interests of why they wouldn't meet with North Korean defectors. That I don't understand, because George Bush did. And I was really disappointed, but I think, I believe it's because they're trusting in China to resolve this issue. And maybe they didn't want to provoke the Chinese by meeting with North Korean defectors. But one of the things that came up through that whole week of meetings uh, for these North Korean defectors, whether they were meeting with members of Congress, whether they were uh, speaking to an NGO panel, the theme that was through all that was that the truth will set them free, that we just need to let the people of North Korea know the truth. 
and that they are the best people to communicate those truths. But the second thing was you cannot trust China. You cannot trust China. And they're concerned that the Trump administration is relying on China to rein in the nuclear program. And they kept saying that is not going to happen. That this, this, uh, we ha we're losing, the, we're losing uh, the reality that this is a communist dictatorship in China. And they will support the dictatorship in North Korea. And that was something they kept warning us about. And they felt that, that this is something that the, the President Trump needs to know is you cannot trust the Chinese regime because it's a communist dictatorship. But the important thing to remember about North Koreans is the moment they cross the border, they fit the definition of a refugee who is, who is falling under the protection of international law because it is a crime against the state, punishable by death for a North Korean to leave their country. So when they're forced back, 100% they will be tortured. 100% they will be imprisoned. And in some cases, they will be executed, especially if they've been in contact with a Christian or adopted the Christian faith. They will immediately be executed. So they fit that definition of a, of a refugee deserving of protection, which uh, falls under the refugee protocol, which China is a signatory to. So China is violating international law when it forces these refugees back. And it's barbaric and inhumane. And they, and they are the ones that are causing this problem by their failure to recognize the serious dangers that these refugees are in. But in addition to that, China allows North Korean agents to freely come into their, into their country to track down refugees, to, uh, to abduct those that are trying to help them. They've, there's been Americans, there's been South Korean citizens that are there in China trying to help refugees. And the North Korean agents have abducted them and taken them back. To, uh, to North Korea. So here you have a country, China, which refuses to allow protections to these refugees, but has no problem allowing North Korean agents free reign, but will not allow the UNHCR to have any access to, the, to these refugees. And that's what's created this horrific situation. And I think uh, many of the, uh, your viewers will remember the story of the two female reporters, uh, Laura Ling and Una Lee, some years ago. They went to China to report. These are American uh, reporters that uh, went to China to report on the, the markets for North Korean women and were actually recorded women being sold. And what happened to them? North Korean agents abducted them, took them to Pyongyang until President Clinton went and got them released. But that's what they were trying to report about. So this is a horrific situation. It's continuing today. It's just as bad today as it was 10 years ago. So watching the increasing ballistic missile attacks from North Korea, Explain to us what's going on in North Korea. Why is it escalating from what you understand and what should President Trump be doing? Well, I believe that uh, this, this regime considers the nuclear program the vital thing to keep them in power. It's what, it, it's, they're totally committed to developing the nuclear program. All of these years of talks, whether it was the uh, four-party talks or the six-party talks or the agreed framework or all these agreements, they never intend to give up the nuclear program. They believe that it's critically important uh, to maintain power. And that's exactly what Kim Jong-un is focused on, maintaining power. He does not care at all for the, the well-being of the people of North Korea. And he's seen what's happened to other dictators who've given up their nuclear programs, like uh, Gaddafi, and he's seen what that led to. And I believe that uh, this escalation is just going to continue. I've been doing this work now for 21 years. And I can tell you, uh, back some years ago, I have some dear friends who go to Pyongyang. You know, there's some Americans that do humanitarian work at Pyongyang, and I'm, I'm not real comfortable with all that. But we're friends, and we do stay in touch. And they told me that in, when they, this was during the, the famine when they were going in there and helping deliver humanitarian relief, which never got to the people, by the way, ended up in markets and helped fund the regime. But they told me that the people they would always see in the airports were uh, from the Middle East. They would go to the Pyongyang airport and everybody there was from the Middle East with briefcases. They were Iranians and Syrians. and So what I think that we have to fear more than North Korea's nuclear program, which I know is getting to the point where it can threaten the United States, I believe that what is a clear and present danger immediately right now is who this regime is working with. I know that Kim Jong-un wants to stay in power. I know he will push and push and push, but he won't go so far to provoke us having to, to, to strike militarily. I believe that because he all is focused on power. 
But the people that he is trading and dealing and selling weapons to, they don't have that fear. And that's what concerns me more than anything. The chemical and, weapon, chemical and biological weapons that they've developed. And remember, uh, just to give you an illustration of this, remember the, the nuclear plant that was, developed, that was in Syria. That, that was a, developed by North Korean technology. And if Israel had not destroyed that site in Syria, imagine what we'd be dealing with right now, with the turmoil in the civil war in Syria if, they, if Assad had already developed nuclear weapons, which would have happened if Israel hadn't taken that site out. But that's the thing that we really need to, to, I think, fear more than a direct attack in the United States, is those countries that are actors on behalf of North Korea. They're allies with that regime that hate the United States of America. What the Trump administration ought to do is look at the people of North Korea. That is our most underutilized resource as far as the people that have escaped from North Korea. This is something that we're not taking advantage of. The fact that so many have escaped and that the North Korean defectors who've escaped have taken over all of the programs that we used to do to reach out to the people. Specifically, balloon launches where they're sending in leaflets and radios and money for the markets. They're broadcasting every day. We're, we're the partner of a North Korean defector radio station that's broadcasting to North Korea every day. They're smuggling USBs in with information. And perhaps the most important thing, they are former military that serve in the North Korean military are directly reaching out to people in the North Korean military, citing Burma, Egypt, Romania, and saying, go with the people against the dictator. They're actually openly calling for them to change that regime and end that dictatorship. And I believe that this is an underutilized resource because they're doing this all on their own. But what they've been able to do is remarkable in getting information in and out of North Korea. And I, and I just want to cite another interesting thing to look at. The North Korean people have changed that country. Not the dictatorship, not the US, not the UN, nobody from the outside, the North Korean people. We have to look at the fact that, that they have a market system now that was created by North Korean women when they, were when they were struggling and starving to death, when millions of North Koreans were starving because of the famine after the Soviet Union collapsed and the, and the support uh, that they lo lost from that in North Korea, the public distribution system broke down. And the public distribution system was a, a very important control mechanism for the regime because that's how everyone got their material goods and their food. Everything came down from the dictator. And when that system broke down, the North Korean people started trading and selling among themselves. And these private markets sprung up all over the country. And the, the regime tried repeatedly to shut them down and finally backed off in 2009 and said, we can't stop it. And they backed off and they've allowed these, these markets to function. So I would say that capitalism is why you don't see the level of starvation. It's not that Kim Jong-un has improved conditions for the people, it's that the people have improved conditions for themselves. And that's a very important development. Second critically important development is information. The North Korean people were, were starving, not just for food, but for information. And they are the ones who have, uh, and their hunger for knowing the reality, have been listening to foreign radio podcasts, uh, get, watching DVDs and, and South Korean movies and American films, and their awareness of the outside world is so much greater than ever before, to the point that Kim Jong-un's North Korea is not the North Korea of Kim Jong-il or Kim Il-sung because things have changed so dramatically. They know they've been lied to. So who's, the, who's most responsible for getting that information in? Again, North Koreans who have escaped, who are tapping into that and trying to get more information in. And I believe that we, uh, at, at this point, this, there's just going to be a continued escalation unless we uh, help reach out to the people of North Korea to give them a hope and an understanding of a future without Kim Jong-un, that this dictatorship can end and that the people in power can be a part of the future and unification. Again, one of the things that, def that defectors kept warning us about is that you can't trust China, that China is really helping this regime and will continue to help this regime. And the fact that it's uh, blocking any progress at the UN on North Korea. For example, the UN Commission of Inquiry has recommended that Kim Jong-un be referred to the International Criminal Court for crimes against humanity. And it's China that's blocking that and blocking that and blocking that and blocking any progress that happens on the international stage. They continue to be a, a supporter of, of that regime. And I believe that um, they will, 
as the defectors kept warning us, they will continue to do that because it, it prevents the possibility of what that communist dictatorship fears, which is a thriving democracy, a united Korea on their border. And so they will do whatever they can to keep that regime in power because they fear that. So if you had the ear of President Trump or Vice President Pence or Secretary Tillerson or Mattis, what would you advise them based on your experience and insights, Suzanne? Well, the first of all, save lives. And, and I mean the lives of the North Koreans that have, that have escaped that are in China now, because that is one thing the defectors told us. American pressure, exposing this issue, raising the refugee issue and the horrific inhumane treatment of these refugees is something that, that China would respond to. They believe that based on past history. So saving the lives of those who have tried to escape. But number two, send a strong message of, the, of our commitment to freedom and human rights and peaceful unification. That is the most important thing right now to bring about peaceful unification. Give the people that are in power uh, in North Korea an understanding that they can be part of the future. That was one thing that President Park tried to do is she st said to the, the highest ranking people there, uh, you, you have a home, you, have a, you will welcome you in South Korea. And the reason why I, I, I say this is so important is that if you are part of that elites, you know the reality of your circumstances. You know that the regime has been lying to the people. And, but what do you face every morning when you get up? You have to be loyal to Kim Jong-un or you're going to end up being murdered horrifically and your entire family. So they don't see any choice, loyalty to Kim Jong-un or death. We have to say there is another choice. That's the second thing. And the third thing is to help these North Korean defector groups that are doing these things, all the balloon launches, the radio broadcasting, they're doing this on their own with no support. And if we could just give a fraction of what we spend on other programs, uh, it would make all the difference in the world because it would, it would uh, give them the ability to reach out to even more people. And the, the stories and reports that we're hearing back from the radio program, just for one example, we, we, we finance the American people, private citizens and churches are the ones that are supporting the shortwave transmission of free North Korea radio. And it's the defectors in Seoul that produce the program. So it's a North Korean defector, American Korean church uh, partnership. And we've been able to stay on the air every day uh, since, uh, since the Bush, Bush era grant ended. Um, and we've been able to remain on the, on the air every day all by private funding. But we're struggling all the time to try to keep the broadcast going. But we're the most targeted for jamming. The North Korea regime regularly sends assassins to try to kill the head of uh, Free North Korea Radio. So those are under indica other indications of how powerful that broadcast is. And that's the one thing that we know. Kim Jong-un fears more than America, more than South Korea. He fears his own people. That is what he fears most is his own people who escape and tell the truth. And that's why the defectors kept saying, the truth will set them free, the truth will set them free. We've got to let them know the truth. For the Trump administration, they have to view China as a potential ally, but a potential adversary. So how do they thread that needle? Well, I think that we, ha well, we have to recognize that we cannot rely on them to, to uh, to help on North Korea. And that's one of the things I think that, that we fear is that Trump has put a lot of hope in Xi Jinping. But um, we can act significantly to stop the money flow into that regime by moving on the banks that are Chinese banks where the money flows. That is absolutely critical. And the great thing about this issue in Congress is that Democrats and Republicans are united on this sanctioning of North Korea. There's a misconception that, that North Korea is a heavily sanctioned country. That is not true at all. A lot of the past sanctions were removed when we were trying to negotiate with North Korea, but there's this false perception that that's the case. It is not the case at all. And that is one of the things that we can do uh, unilaterally because we are the, the corresponding bank, the US dollar is the, is the corresponding uh, bank for, um, for these transactions, and if we could sanction those banks. Now, well, the Obama administration sanctioned some of the companies, but we need to sanction the Chinese banks. And we can do that. That will cut off the flow of money that's going into that regime that buys the favor and buys the loyalty of the people in the regime. And that's something critical that we have to do. The other thing we can do on the international stage is to stop 
the, the labor, the slave labor. Another cash cow for the regime is the, the fact that it sends its own citizens abroad. It sends its own citizens abroad to be basically slave laborers. They work in these different countries. They're isolated. They just, they're paid, they're basically their pay goes to the regime. That's a, hundreds of millions of dollars go into the regime from that practice of, of using their own people's slave laborers abroad. Suzanne, tell us about your role with North Korean de defectors. Well, certainly I uh, am the president of the Defense Forum Foundation, and our foundation is focused on preserving a strong national defense and uh, focused on American security. But when I became president, I, I realized that you know every single country that's a threat to the United States is also a threat to their own people, without exception. And that I shouldn't just focus on American national security, but should also look to promote freedom and democracy and human rights abroad. So back in the late, uh, in the mid-1990s actually, I started hosting defectors that had escaped from totalitarian regimes, Soviet Union, uh, Cuba, China, to tell their stories. Why did you turn against your own country? And I was fascinated by the things that they reported about conditions in their country and what, what made them decide to embrace America. And I, um, at that time, realized that we hadn't heard from a North Korean, that we'd heard all these horrible things about North Korea. They were developing nuclear m missile program back then as well, and were a threat. Um, but we hadn't really heard from a North Korean defector. So I started uh, working to, to host a defector from North Korea in 1996 and beating down the door of the South Korean embassy because there were, weren't a lot of them, and they were all under protection for the South Korean government, and succeeded in 1997 in hosting the first North Korean defectors that had ever spoken out in the United States of America. It was Colonel J. Chu Hall, who had served in the Army of North Korea, and Ko Young Hwan, who had served as a diplomat in North Korea. And that began my labor of love. How can people help you, Suzanne? Well, I would love for people to go to our website, uh, www.defenseforumfoundation.org, and look at the uh, look at the work we're doing on for Free North Korea, the Free North Korea radio information about that radio station. To me, that's the most important thing is to support that radio station and also the Blue Launches and the other uh, work that we're doing with the Defector NGOs. We're always looking for partners. And that's the only way we're gonna be able to continue this to this program as we get more partners. So I'd love to have more people get involved in this effort and join us in this uh, the North Korea human rights movement.